Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to this NPTEL MOOC course and this course is on phonetics and phonology, a broad overview. We have had a lot of lectures on phonetics and phonology and many of those we assumed certain knowledge about syllables. So in this unit we will talk about syllables in greater detail. So while we assumed knowledge of syllables, it is because it is relatively easy for people to count the syllables of a word in a language that they speak. So much easier than counting the segments sometimes. Um, the, so the vowel is not uh, very easy to determine and but the syllable is easier to count. So uh, syllables uh, frequently appear in environments of phonological rules uh, both for deriving allophones and in more for phonemic alternation. And Syllables are also the units that bear stress and they are the ones which are counted for rhythm and accent and other purposes. So for all prosodic purposes, um, syllables are counted. So uh, syllables also serve as the anchor points for tones in tonal systems and in intonation. So as we just said, in prosody, syllables are quite vital in the analysis. So in the International Phonetic Alphabet, the, uh, the IPS uh, symbols, syllables are shown by separating them with a boundary symbol, uh, especially a period like the one that you see here as in uh, connect, connective, okay, three syllables. And there are other notations for syllables like uh, this symbol, the sigma symbol is also used for syllables and another approach avoids boundary symbols and assumes in sy the syllables are phonological constituents. The notation is tree structure and the syllable constituents are labeled with as we just said with the Greek sigma for syllable and this is how uh, we see the representation in a tree structure. So, the word connective that you just saw, if it is just a consonant and a vowel, it is a one branching node to the left and then the vowel and then if there are two consonants flanking the vowel on both sides, then we have two nodes towards both sides, the consonant for the two consonants and similarly again for the last syllable tiv. And a more concise notation uses brackets and notated with just a sigma. So like this showing a syllable division or like this which where uh, the syllable division is shown outside the syllable. So the onset of a syllable is a consonant or sequence of consonants at the beginning of a syllable and the coda is the consonant or sequence of consonants at the end of a syllable and the nucleus is the vowel or diphthong found at the syllable's core and functioning as its sonority peak. So three important structural points of a syllable, they are the onset, the coda and most important of all the nucleus. So these are supposed to constitute the structure of a syllable. And the nucleus also constitutes our so-called sonority peak. Recall our sonority hierarchy that we saw in the feature lecture where we saw that uh, depending on the features there is certain hierarchy, there is a kind where we have the vowels which are the most sonorous and vowels, liquids, glides 
uh, nasals and then on one side we have the obstruents which are minus sonorant and then we have the plus sonorants which are the vowels, liquids, glides and also nasals and these are supposed to be plus sonorant. So, obstruents are minus sonorant and these are plus sonorants. So, recall your uh, class, uh, your lecture on sonorants. So, vowels, liquids, glides, nasals, where the vowels are the ones which are the most sonorous and as a result, often the nucleus is almost always occupied by a vowel which is the one which is the segment with the highest sonority peak. So, uh, it is obligatory for a syllable to have a nucleus, very common to lack a coda in languages and uh, less common to lack an onset. So, uh, that is more or less how you would see syllables in languages. A syllable would always have a nucleus and an onset most of the time, but across languages to lack a coda is more common. So, the linguistic pressure, the pressure in a language is to avoid a coda, but to have an onset, uh, to have a nucleus always and if possible have an onset, but do the most to avoid a coda. So, in general that is what we see in languages. Of course, there are very many languages which have codas, it is not as if there is a complete ban on codas, codas do occur, but there are often constraints which would uh, come in the way of having a coda rather the final consonant of a syllable uh, would become often an onset by various processes like epenthesis, uh, syncopy, etc. So, we will see those processes shortly in uh, some data that we have and before that we will let us again talk about how we see uh, syllabification in different languages. So, syllabification is how syllabification uh, can be done or is it predictable, is it unpredictable, what are the, uh, the components which drive syllabification in a language. So, the deriving syllabification must be language specific. And every language has its own principles of syllabification, uh, Spanish um, 4, cuatro, and Ilocano 4, cuatro. ok. This is from borrowing, but uh, it seems Spanish syllabifies as qua and, and tro, whereas um, Ilocano uh, would like to have this final consonant as a coda, whereas in Spanish the two consonants in between would rather be the onset of the following syllable. And um, cross linguistically or the linguistic principles which uh, drive these uh, kind of syllabifications, uh, they are both ok with this in the sense that as we just talked about uh, this before, uh, a syllable would always want to have a nucleus which it does and an onset which it does, but avoids tries to avoid codas which is clearly seen here that both the consonants are now the onset of the following syllable. Whereas, Ilocano satisfies the uh, universal sort of a characteristic among languages to avoid coders, to have a nucleus as well as a, uh, as an onset and this is, this is satisfied in the sense that uh, Ilocano does not syllabify like this. Now, this would have, this would go against uh, the syllabification tendencies that we see in languages, this is not seen. However, this is a possibility because it satisfies um, what we see cross linguistically a constraint to have onset. So, onset is almost very often preferred in languages, so that is satisfied. However, in this language there seems to be greater tolerance for coders than in Spanish. So, it tolerates a coda, but also has an onset. And whereas in Spanish would 
prefer not to have codas as, as well at all and have them as onsets of the following syllables. So, these are the two syllables in Spanish and Ilocano and speakers judgments of the two syllables is like this. In Spanish, they would say qua and tro. In Ilocano, they would say quat and ro. So, this is what we meant when we said that language can choose its own principles of syllabification. It might completely not want to have codas, avoid codas to the extent possible. If it is possible to make it the onset of the following syllable, just make it the onset of, make of consonant the onset of the following syllable rather than a coda of the previous syllable. But at the same time, there may be also languages which may tolerate some codas, may say as long as the following consonant, as long as the following syllable will have an onset, it is okay to tolerate a coda in the preceding syllable. Now, having looked at how languages may differ in terms of syllabification, uh, let us now see what constitutes a syllable. We already know nucleus, onset and coda, but how do we find uh, the nucleus, onset and coda in a language? We already saw a few examples, but let us discuss this a bit more to understand how a nucleus may be different in different languages. So, the nucleus of a syllable is normally a vowel or a diphthong and almost always they are not vowels or diphthongs, but in some languages other segments with lower sonority like liquids and nasals can be syllabic and form syllable nuclei. And there is a one to one correspondence between plus syllabic sounds and syllables. So, some sounds are plus syllabic if you recall from your features, from the lecture on features that some sounds are plus syllabic which means they can be the nucleus of a syllable. That is what we mean when we say that some sounds are plus syllabic. So, every plus syllabic sound is the nucleus of its own syllable and hence we have um, examples, even there are examples from English where a plus syllabic sound is the nucleus of its own syllable. So, it is plus syllabic in the sense that it is not a vowel which is almost always the nucleus of all syllables, but sometimes some segments which are not vowels can also be the nucleus of a syllable. Syllabic affiliations of consonants, the main task in the syllabification is determining to which syllable the consonants belong. And when a consonant immediately precedes a vowel, it must belong to the same syllable as the vowel. So, uh, when uh, so we have um, examples like VCV is syllabified as VCV, not as VCV. So this is fine, and this is not so, not so good. Um, why is that so? So, when a consonant precedes a vowel, it must belong to the same syllable as the vowel. So, there is this, we have this uh, now precedence relationship here where the consonant is preceding the vowel and then um, and hence it should be in the same syllable as the vowel like this one and unlike this one. So, this is not good versus this is considered better. So, um, so, hence that is the, that is what you do in syllabifications. When you are asked to syllabify, you your task is to find out that where the consonants um, belong to, which which syllable the consonants belong to, the, the preceding syllable, following syllable, etc. And uh, there are some of these principles that generally. Um, are followed that if there is a consonant vowel sequence, it is better that a consonant precedes a vowel, it is better that the consonant is a part of that syllable where the following vowel is a nucleus. And when V C C V sometimes um, V C C V as we saw in the quattro example, sometimes you know, V C C V where the language can optimally satisfy you know, the need to have a a onset 
and also have a uh, coda in the preceding syllable and however sometimes uh, both the uh, consonants can be the onset of the of the following syllable so uh, the the mm, this one is pretty clear and this one we have options so if there are two consonants in between we have two options but if you have one consonant in between we don't ha seem to have the option the consonant has to be a part of the syllable where the following vowel is the nucleus and uh, now we come to something important in um, languages that is the maximal onset principle uh, we can often predict uh, the syllabification of inter vocalic clusters by observing the set of consonantal clusters that may begin a word now uh, we already saw intervocalic um, clusters in the preceding example um, now um, something called the maxima maximal onset principle may guide some syllabification in some languages where uh, the language may try to have as many consonants in the onset position as possible rather than having the consonants in the coda positions in english approve is syllabified as approve because english words can begin with pr but uh, wheatley is um, syllabified with li because no word can begin with tl okay as a rule of some languages will prefer to have syllabification where the consonant cluster is a legit consonant cluster in that language and if it is not a legit consonant cluster like tl which is not possible in English then uh, th the syllabification will prefer to not have we will not prefer this syllabification because tl is an absolutely impossible sequence of consonants in English. The maximal onset principle can often can predict syllabification in languages but is not infallible that is uh, important to remember it maximizes onsets and in English that is followed to the extent that it it is um, it that the consonant clusters are legit consonant clusters are the consonant clusters which are possible in um, English but if the consonant clusters are not possible then the maximal onset principle is not followed in Ilocano quattro is syllabified quat and rho even though there are words that can begin with tr for example tes yeah, as in as in uh, three so um, hence uh, it is not the the why did uh, Ilocano choose the syllabification it is not because that um, ter is not possible unlike the English example where ter was not possible and hence maximal uh, onset principle was not satisfied here maximal onset um, maximizing the onset is not satisfied even though ter is a, a proper uh, consonant sequence in the language and the maximal onset principle though useful is not specific enough to be part of a phonological analysis so and that is the, um, that is issue with you know, the maximal onset principle it is very useful to show that the languages uh, have this preference for maximizing onsets to th at the cost of not having onsets not having codas but it is not as if that um, that is a constraint that is very strictly observed uh, by languages because language as we saw that from the Locano example uh, the language did, even though has this cluster did not satisfy the maximal onset principle uh, the reason is that a full grammar of a language should say what the word initial onsets are and um, so how do we have a scheme for syllabification uh, there are three rules that apply one is assigned syllable assignment assigned syllable nodes to be in one to one correspondence with plus syllabic sounds and um, onset formation so we one we um, assign syllable nodes so syllable nodes are assigned suppose there are cv 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 so we assign syllable nodes 
such that the nucleus is still V and the onset is the C. Now, um, onset formation. Joint consonants to the following syllable provided the resulting cluster can occur at the beginning of a word. So, um, as, as we just said, um, we, what do we do? We join consonants to the following syllable and like this, there is a pre following vowel and the uh, preceding and there is a preceding consonant and as a result, this is one syllable again this is another syllable. And so, we have the nodes and then we connect the consonants with the, you know, with the onsets if there is a, a following vowel. So, we have to remember that when we have consonant clusters um, at the beginning at the uh, consonant clusters, those consonant clusters will have to be legit consonant clusters in the language. For instance, the, le can never be uh, in an onset position in English because that is never the beginning of a word in English. So, that is one thing to remember when you are assigning onsets. While assigning onsets, whether the CC, the consonant cluster is a legit consonant cluster, CC um, has to be uh, has to be one of the concerns apart from uh, node assignment. So, and then two onsets determining the onsets. So, finally, then we have coda formation. Join any consonants not yet syllabified to the preceding syllable as a coda. So, uh, in English, we, we, we can assign a coda when we have these those left out consonants which are which could not make it to the to the onset. So, um, a syllable assignment must affiliate a syllable node with R and A. So, let us see this um, contract the underlying form then syllable nodes we have two, two vowels here we have the syllable assignment the node assignment to two vowels then the second step of of assigning the onsets, onset, onset, okay. This is then, then the second step. Remaining consonants are syllabified by coda formation. Now, what was left behind? Now, n could not make it to the, uh, to the onset position of either syllable or kata could not make it to the onset position of any syllable. Now, these will be your codas. So, the coda, the step of coda formation is the last step and those are the consonants which are, um, which are not connected to any node after the nucleus assignment and the onset formation. Syllabification is uh, complicated since rules of phonology rearrange the sequence of consonants and vowels through deletion, insertion and other processes. Uh, one health view is that rules of syllabification are persistent and uh, that is underlying phonological representations are syllabified by the syllabification rules at the outset, outset of the uh, derivation. So, um, persistent syllabification is uh, persistent in the sense that um, hardly any consonant or vowel material in a word will be left out unsyllabified. So, you, we, so those are uh, and we see that from the various processes, phonological processes of insertion, deletion and other processes. So, uh, that is underlying phonological representations are syllabified by the syllabification rules at the outset of the derivation. So, before all our segmental rules apply, we have our syllabification rules. So, whenever a phonological rule applies, the syllabification rules um, reapply if possible. So, um, now we see from some real example linguistic um, examples about how syllabifications, syllabification and phonological derivations um, are, uh, how, how what role the syllab syllables play in, in phonological derivations. 
Uh, Sync up a rule deletes the second vowel of a, of a word when it is not adjacent to a consonant cluster or final consonant. Uh, so, we have tonkawa syncopy. What happens in tonkawa syncopy is that the vowel goes to null, so which means the vowel is deleted uh, in the position. Um, so, uh, so it deletes the second vowel of a word when it is not adjacent to a consonant cluster or a final consonant. So, in this position, the vowel is deleted. Okay. So, what does it? So, what does it show us? It shows us that um, that if if there are the se the second vowel uh, can be deleted now, and it shows us that we have this kind of a uh, of a syllable in Tonkawa instead of a CV uh, CV. Uh, C V con C V C V C V C syllable. We, we uh, Tonkawa now would like to have one vowel deleted so that it has um, two uh, consonants in that position. I, and um, let's uh, look at more examples. And uh, here's an example of uh, Notohono. So he holds it. And um, so, first, f the first pr uh, step in what we discussed before we have syllable assignment, and then we have onset formation, and then finally we have coda formation. So, after onset formation, what was left was this material, uh, the coda um, on the right hand side of the final uh, syllable, and that has to be uh, the last step where the coda is formed. Now, once the form is syllabified, it is submitted to the phonological rules component of the grammar and syncopy removes the second vowel. So, um, so we have now we have this noto hono. So, we have a CV, CV, CV and CVC. Now, remember uh, when after two uh, CVs, this V is is going to be deleted. So, now we have syllabification, but syncopy will now remove the second vowel. The syllable nodes are now no longer in one to one correspondence. Now, once a vowel is deleted, which is the nucleus of a syllable, then we do not have the syllable node there. Therefore, the persistent rule of assignment, syllable assignment is now applicable. Once, once that node goes away, syllabification happens again. And, um, we have uh, again persistent syllabification. We have uh, not hono. So now, uh, after the after removal of the second vowel, we have to now syllabify again the remaining uh, consonant. Um, the, the consonant which is now left behind after the deletion of the vowel has to be assigned a syllable node, and it it is uh, it becomes a part of the previous syllable. So, according to persistent syllabification approach, ter is a syllable initial segment at the outset of the phonology, but ends up as a, a syllable final a consonant. So, whereas at one point it was the onset when it was um, when this vowel is there, once the vowel is deleted, it has it it has uh, no choice but to align itself with another. Um, with another syllable node which is available there which does not have a coda in the preceding uh, syllable and that becomes and hence it assumes the position of the coda in the preceding syllable. Like other phonological rules, syllabification rules often respect word boundaries and onset formation and coda formation are often word bounded. So, um, something that we uh, we have to remember is that respect boundaries, because syllabification happens across words. Uh, so, uh, in sorry, in words, it has to uh, it has to be um, uh, applicable to um, to words in such a way that it recognizes the boundaries. So uh, here's an example from uh, German das ist ein Ox and um, das ist ein um, Alter. 
ox. So, uh, so th that is an old fox. Um, and that is an uh, altar ox. So, that, that is an old fox, old ox. And then uh, the final uh, consonants of das is um, ein and alter all precede vowels. So, as a result, we have, um, we can see that the word boundaries are, um, are respected uh, in the sense, in the phonology, in, in the phonology at least. Uh, of course, uh, in speech segmentation, that is another matter altogether in speech. In the phonology, we have the, the syllables um, respect the word boundaries in the sense, what does this mean? That means that this does not become, these do not become um, uh, syllables of the following word. So, onset formation could affiliate them with um, syllable nodes uh, attached to these vowels. So, under a word bounded onset formation rule for German, no such affiliation is possible. So, uh, in German, they are word bounded onset. So, onset do not, onset, the final consonant of one word does not become the syllable of the following word. And those prosodic boundaries are maintained in a language like German. Uh, these consonants must undergo coda formation and are syllabified within their own word. So, that is what we see here that all of these are separate syllables. Das ist ein alter ox. And whether um, uh, onset formation is word bounded or not is evidently language specific. And, um, and of course, there may be languages where uh, those boundaries are sometimes um, um, uh, completely um, removed and as a result we have uh, we have instances of languages where the, the, those between word boundaries are rem uh, the, con the syllabic syllable boundaries are removed and as a result we have um, consonants which uh, syllabify with the following word etc. And there are examples from languages where we have uh, new words as a result of such kind of syllabification. So, um, obligatory onsets, optional codas and forbidden codas. In many languages, example Arabic Ilocano, every syllable must begin with an onset that is no syllable may begin uh, with a vowel. Onsets are never forbidden, there is no such thing as an onsetless language. The typology for codas is the opposite. In many languages, codas are forbidden and there are no languages that require every syllable to have a coda. So, the, the uh, importance of onsets and codas um, are um, the relative importance of onsets versus codas is something to uh, understand, is something important that should be understood. In many languages, every syllable must have an on, uh, must be given with, um, begin with an onset. So, there are languages which obligatorily prefer onsets and no syllable may begin with a vowel. So, if there is a syllable with a vowel, the language will on insert a consonant so that it has an onset. So, there are those languages, but there are no languages, um, uh, but the, the, so onsets are never forbidden. So, it is no language ever says that delete the consonant so that the onset is not there in the vowel. So, that is um, that's an absolute impossibility and there, are, there is no such thing as an onsetless language. So, however, um, there are languages which obligatorily uh, prefer to have onsets. Um, the reverse uh, applies to codas. In many languages, codas are forbidden and there are no languages that require every syllable to have a coda. Uh, the only universal syllable present in every language is CV. And the preference for syllables to have onsets can be seen in German. Uh, the vowel initial syllables undergo a rule of glottal epenthesis in careful speech. They will surface with um, uh, glottal onset and that is often seen in languages that uh, epenthesis as we just discussed is one of the ways to repair if uh, um, uh, a, a syllable which does not have an onset. So, one of those preferred um, consonants is that of a glottal stop. And glottal epenthesis is uh, found often in languages when before a vowel um, uh, a glottal stop is often inserted as the onset of a syllable. So, and 
Um, so, now we see the three steps that we first discussed that uh, if we take the German example of Das Assign, Alter Ox. So, we have all these um, uh, uh, six syllables and we have the um, uh, syllable assignment, onset formation, coda formation, first syllable inside assignment and then we have onset formation and then we have um, uh, glottal appendices. So, uh, and as a result we see that this language is trying to maintain the syllable boundaries between the, uh, the word boundaries uh, between uh, the different syllables. So, as long as it is the same um, same word we have a, a glottal uh, appendices and um, if it is and if it is a different word mm, if it is a different word we have a glottal appendices but if it is the same word of course we do not have a glottal appendices. So, neutralization in codas coda position is often the location of neutralization and um, we often see that um, in languages uh, that is um, which do not prefer to have um, codas so much at the, the codas are limited in such languages we have we will give some examples here we have an example of Chibaeno uh, there there is a contrast between the liquids la and ra in certain positions an optional rule of liquid gliding applies converting la to the tap um, la and the tap to ra and to ya. And neutralization uh, in codas, coda position is often look. Uh, and sorry, this is a triple neutralization because the year is also a phoneme of this dialect. So, and and both of these are neutralized to um, year. So uh, forms with uh, uh, we have karta, we have ikata, and so we have um, we have these neutralizations for both l and r, r. In all these cases, in all cases where liquid gliding applies, uh, the l and r occurs before a consonant or word finally. So, um, hence we can see that this, where does this happen? It happens only in the coda positions. To formulate a rule that applies both preconsonantly and finally, an analysis proposed to use curly brackets. These are notational devices that denotes the logical notation or. Um, so, um, we can say that in um, in Chibayano, the sonorants, um, the, the, uh, some sonorants, um, le and re, uh, become ya in the position where they are word final or in the coda position. And liquids are converted to ya if they precede a consonant or are word final. Uh, many linguists have said that curly brackets are not very useful and for many cases like Chibaeno, liquid gliding a widely adopted alternative solution is supposed that the environment is syllable final. So, um, liquids just become here in a syllable final position. And thus, the neutralization of liquids occurs in coda instead of instead of saying that uh, two positions a word final and um, and and preceding a consonant it's it's much uh, simpler to say that that's a coda position and then other processes which apply to syllables are fortition and lenition phonological rules often uh, alter uh, onset consonants so that they have a tighter construction in the vocal tract such changes are described as fortition. Fortition means that uh, fricative becomes a, a stop or um, uh, so uh, as, as a result there is a tighter construction in the vocal tract. So, becoming stronger. In some cases fortition is a small effect that produces only subtle allophones. In English the first onset n is given tighter articulatory closure than the second n uh, in, in, in a word like none. The difference is so small it is not depicted in, in IPA transcription. Now, um, that is the difference between onset and codas and codas are, um, are susceptible to rules of neutralization, to rules of um, 
not Futitian but Lenitian, whereas onsets are the reverse, onsets are preferred, they are not neutralized or they are strengthening rules rather than uh, Lenitian rules. So, uh, the glide year in onset position is realized as a fricative je. It retains the same general principle place of articulation but acquires a much tighter closure and in coda year appears. So, how do we express the Puteno, uh, Puteno Spanish glide fetition? We just say that the glide becomes je in the environment where there is a preceding um, syllable position. So, syllable initially uh, year becomes je. So, uh, syllable initially as we just said is a position for fortition, syllable final uh, or the coda positions are positions for neutralization and lenition. Weakening of closure which is the opposition of fortition is called lenition, it occurs commonly in codas and fortition occurs in onsets. Also uh, codas are subject to deletion, a natural extension of lenition is deletion often targets coda consonants but leaves onset consonants intact. In French, nasal consonants delete in codas but not in onsets. This produces nasal zero alternation. So, nasal consonants are deleted apart from being the, they can be neutralized, they can become uh, they can be lenited and they can also be deleted. So, as we can see in the French example, in the, the vowel becomes a nasal in this position where it is final as because of the deletion of the nasal the vowel becomes nasal. So, we have um, the uh, these French example of uh, bon and and uh, bon te and uh, and bonne where we have a schwa deletion here, but we have um, ter deletion um, so, so we have uh, in this in this position we have ne deletion, so we have bon, and then we have again nasal deletion here, so we have bonté or bon, but bon. <coughs> and um, similarly, so these are the uh, surface form, forms of uh, bon, uh, bonté, and uh, bon. Many rules emphasize uh, vowels um, can be analyzed in terms of the syllable structure of the language they occur in. So, uh, vocalic emphasis often makes it possible to syllabify consonants that otherwise could not be syllabified. So, we have you all many, um, y y well many Yakuts, a Penitian language of Northern California, the first row of, a, of data gives four partial verb paradigms. Yeah, well many quotes is very important uh, language to understand how um, uh, structure is, how to a couple of different processes are actually trying to achieve a certain type of um, a certain type of syllable. So, um, there are a couple of rules of epenthesizing, uh, vocalic epenthesis and um, um, syllabification which uh, would not be, would not be easy to understand if we did not have the idea of syllabification in that language. And um, syllables and derivations of uh, vocalic epenthesis. So, uh, these are the examples from Ya well many Yakuts and we see that Ya well many Yakuts have a uh, glottal stop and uh, uh, before uh, a stop consonant and we have the, the these suffixes al or n or hin or mi and nith and preceding those we have consonants in all these examples. Now, uh, and similarly we have the nouns where we do not have those suffixes. Now, let us see what happens in ya well many wakuts in terms of alternation. So, in the last uh, lecture we talked about allomorphs. So, allomorphs are different forms of morphemes and 
Uh, an allomorph of the form CVCC occurs before vowel initial um, suffixes such as al and n. So, we saw the two consonants of there in the data just now. An allomorph of the form CVCCIC occurs before consonant initial suffixes such as hin, mi or nith. So, what is the difference between these two? One is vowel initial, the other is consonant initial. So, let us see um, uh, other alternations in e e EI well when e you could. All vowel 0 alternations of this type involve the vowel E. This suggests that the alternation is not is due to a parenthesis not syncope. So, uh, which means we saw the process of determining whether something is a parenthesis or deletion in the last class and we will not go through those th um, processes again. So, suffice it to say that we have to insert a vowel if there are two consonants. Now, we have the application of the rule here. We have the underlying form pakt al and then we have pakt hin and we have pakt. So, these are the underlying forms, but let us see what happens in these two forms. Okay. So, now we already see that we have a parenthesis applying there and as a result we have the surface forms of pakt in and pa hit, but not here when you have packed al. So, all UL many syllables begin with a single consonant and end up to uh, end with and end with up to one consonant. So, as a result, when we have um, when we have clusters like this, UL many equals introduces a parenthesis and the underlying uh, representations that undergo a parenthesis are the ones that could not be syllabified under these limitations. An alternative is to let the principles of syllabification do most of the work. Syllabification incorporates whatever it can, then a parenthesis provides a vowel to permit syllabification of the remainder. We must state proper rules of onset formation and coda formation for you all many which forms onsets and codas of just one consonant. So, uh, onset formation in e, e, e are well many, just a single consonant to the following syllable. Coda formation is just join a single and unaffiliated consonant to the preceding syllable. Onset formation must precede coda formation forcing the syllabification. So, um, here, so along with morphophonology in e, e many, we understand that the uh, the, uh, the idea of the proper syllable, syllable in your many drives all these um, types of epenthesis in the language. So, we have onset formation with, um, with these onsets and, um, and then we have coda formation with the uh, remaining consonants, but then there is still something remaining. There are these parts remaining even after coda formation and that is when we have the syllabification. There are still consonants third in the second and third forms and they are unaffiliated with any syllable. Such consonants are these are the stray consonants now. These are the stray consonants which have to be syllabified. Suppose that a parenthesis is formulated to repair any consonants that are left stray following the initial application of syllabification. That rule can be expressed as so null goes to uh, the vowel e if there is a following consonant. So, insert e before a stray consonant and e means an unsyllabified since consonant and since only two representations include unsyllabified consonants, only they trigger a parenthesis. Since syllabification rules are persistent, they will reapply establishing the normal syllabification on the surface. So, finally, we have syllable assignment, we have onset formation, we have coda formation and we have the surface forms where we ha e had to be um, inserted because the, the particular kind of coda was um, not possible. The, the stray consonants had to be adjusted with the epenthesis. So, the revised version of epenthesis an improvement for two reasons. It unifies the separate environments of the earlier rule in one single environment that is a stray consonants 
have to be again resyllabified. It establishes a connection between syllabification principles and the epenthesis. So, epenthesis in Ualmeni cannot be understood without understanding the syllabification procedure of uh, Ualmeni Yakuts. So, thank you for your attention. We are we have uh, finished our uh, lecture on syllables today, uh, which uh, will be helpful in understanding both phonology and uh, phonological alterations as well as morphological alterations. Thank you.